This is a session organized by a number of organizations. I want to start by uh, thanking our allies organizations. Uh, it's Ilga and Art International and the Canadian AJV AIDS Legal uh, Network. And it's also organized by a number of intersex um, organizations. We are going to have the, the chance of presenting ourselves during the session. My name is Mau Harrell and we have the, the honor of um, moderating it. Um, and we have speakers from the UK, Holly Uber is, is here. Uh, from Switzerland, we have Daniela Kufer, Marcus Bauer, and we are going to have uh, the words of Morgan Carpenter from um, Australia in, in a video. This is going to be a session that is going to combine testimonies in, in, and, and comments in, in person and also video presentation. Um, I don't know um, how much you know about intersex issues in general. Intersex people are those people born with bodies that vary from both female and male standards that vary, that vary from at the chromosome, of, the chromosome level, uh, the level of gonads, genitals, and there are other kinds of um, bodily variations in compass in the word intersex. Most, more importantly, intersex people, and especially intersex children around the world, are subjected to medical procedures, including surgeries and hormones and other procedures in order to so-called normalize their bodies. These medical procedures uh, are taking place without their consent and without any medical need. <coughs> As most of us here in this panel are intersex adults and we know that the consequences of these procedures uh, last during our, our lives. And just recently in the UN, these kind of procedures and other experiences faced by intersex people are starting to be related with the human rights framework and identified as human rights violations. Um, probably you know that the, 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 the report presented by the Special Rapporteur in, uh, on torture last year identified these kind of procedures uh, in the context of its mandate following um, uh, some uh, language introduced by the Committee Against Torture in, 2000, in 2011. However, the first time that intersex issues were presented before the Human Rights, um, the Human Rights Commission was in 2004. So the UN has been hearing about intersex issues for a long time. And this is the first time that we have a side event to talk specifically on intersex issues. So I want you to be really aware that this is an historic uh, event. It's an historic opportunity, and not only for us, but also for you to participate with us um, in this event. So I'm going to allow the first speakers to take the floor. Good morning. Can you hear me? My name is Daniela Truffer. I am co-founder of the Human Rights Group Association <coughs> with Org, based in Zurich. We are an international group who is fighting against the intersex gender mutilation for six, about six years now. I was born with so-called atypical genitalia. <coughs> Doctors couldn't tell if I was a boy or a girl. At two and a half months, they castrated me. They threw my healthy testicles, which I had in the abdomen and in the garbage bin. Later, the castration was declared a mistake. One doctor said that I was a boy with a hypospadias. We will see later what's a hypospadias. However, now they had to continue this way 
Um, when I was seven years old, they cut my genital to make me look more like a girl. The doctors always lied to me and to my parents. I spent my life in fear, pain and shame. I couldn't talk to anybody. Only after meeting others like me in my 30s, I found out that I wasn't alone. When I asked for my medical records, the, hosp the hospital said that they didn't exist anymore. Only when I threatened to return with a lawyer, I was eventually able to obtain them. At this point, all possibilities of legal redress had expired long ago due to the statute of limitation. I remain a patchwork created by doctors, bruised and scarred. Compared to many others, I am still lucky in so far that I was able to learn the truth from my medical records and that I still have some sexual feelings. I wish I could have grown up with, without surgery and decide myself. After more than a decade of trying to reason with doctors, together with others from self-help groups, I am convinced that this is futile and only le legislation will stop the ongoing mutilations. Zwischengeschlechter.org. This means uh, intersex in German. Difficult to pronounce. Okay. Um, I myself, I'm not an intersex person, but the partner of a person concerned. And uh, during the next minute, I'd like to give you a short overview on intersex genital mutilation. And, uh, our definition of uh, IGM in the forthcoming CRC NGO report is well, what is displayed above is that the uh, intersex genital mutilations consist of a non-consensual, medically unnecessary, irreversible cosmetic genital surgeries and or other similar treatments including imposition of hormones performed on children with variations of sex anatomy without evidence of benefit but justified by psychosocial indications shaped by societal and cultural norms and beliefs. The next point is what are so-called variations of sex anatomy. These are more than just uh, infamous so-called ambiguous genitals. So-called ambiguity, ambiguity is possible on three levels or layers. First, on the genetic level. Second, on the level regarding sex hormone producing organs and the level of response to these hormones by the body. And third, physical appearance, which includes external genitals as well as secondary sex markers. Ambiguity can mean that A, atypical characteristics appear, uh, are seen on one or more of these three layers and or B, while the individual layers may appear perfectly normal, together they don't match. For example, a newborn child with male exterior genitals, but the uterus and ov ovaries and karyotype XX. Now, to understand how so-called ambiguous genitals develop, we have to consider for a moment a fact of life usually omitted in biology classes. And this is, we all started out as intersex. 
we all started out with uh, precursors for ovaries and testicles, and we all had ambiguous genitals. Only after the seventh week, male or male, female, male or female genitals develop out of the same basic parts as follows. Now, on the right side of the diagram, is shown uh, how most females develop. The left side shows how most males develop. Note how the urethral opening only ascends to the tip of the penis during the very last stage. And for every one of you who always wondered why male private parts have a fission, this is the explanation. Some, but not all, intersex children are born with so-called atypical genitals. Children with genitals resembling diagrams 3 and 4 may be diagnosed, diagnosed as boys with hypostasis and submitted to masculinizing hypostasis surgeries. Children with genitals resembling diagrams 1 to 5 may be diagnosed as girls with an enlarged clitoris and submitted to feminizing clitoris reduction and vaginoplasty. Due to time restrictions and uh, the multitude of possibilities, I will only outline the three most frequent forms of IgM. The most common form nowadays is hypostasis surgery. Hypostasis is uh, the medical term for when the urethral opening is not at the tip of the penis, but the, on the underside, somewhere below or much below. The main justification for hypostasis surgery is the assumption that a real man must be able to pee standing and must be able to impregnate women by a penetrative sex. In comparison, from the point of view of the doctors, a numbed glance due to repeat surgeries is considered a minor obstacle. Persons concerned obviously have different opinions. Now we always uh, show pictures of the surgeries because we feel it has to be shown to understand but sometimes there are persons who have a problem with looking at such pictures. <coughs> to those uh, I advise to heed the trigger warnings usually there. Now th this is uh, as you can see hypostasis surgery is no minor surgery. The penis is, slide op is sliced open and from the foreskin or in another skin graft, an artificial urethra is formed. Hypostasis surgery is fraught with complications, which can result in serious medical problems where none had been before. For example, <coughs> urethral strictures can lead to kidney failure. However, for doctors and hospitals, complications are lucrative. Many children have, ma have major surgeries every year until they're old enough to resist further treatments. <coughs> the language of the doctors is telling. For example, the official diagnosis hypostasis cripple is reserved for persons who, after repeat surgeries, the doctors have given up hope as, and uh, judged them as hopeless cases. So these, these persons weren't born as cripples, but were made to cripples by repeat surgery. For decades, doctors again and again have been stating the lack of outcome studies, but still prefer to just go on with more and more surgeries by book or by crook, relishing the surgical challenge. This is typical not only for hypostasis surgery, but for all forms of IgM. Until the second hypostasis boom in the 1990s, feminizing corrections were arguably the most frequent form due to surgical limitations, according to the infamous surgeon's motto, you can dig a hole, but you can't build a pole. In the above cases, the atypical development is caused either by an excess of male hormones, <coughs> for example CAH, or a low ability of the body to respond to sex hormones, for example, AIS. <clears throat> Up to the 1990s, an enlarged clitoris was amputated or excised without further ado. Doctors famously linked Western, these Western clitoris amputations to FGM, 
justifying the former by the alleged proven harmlessness of the latter. Today, doctors use more modern techniques aiming at sparing the main nerves, though, as you can see, they still cut away most tissue and the person's concerns still deplore loss of sensitivity. Again, the language of the doctors is telling. For example, the material shortage mentioned here, when they cut off too much skin and then have problem during reconstruction. The third most common practice is castration, justified by an alleged high cancer risk. However, as you can see, the risks are in most cases rather low. CIAS, for example, is 0.8%. So uh, if this is a high cancer risk and uh, you would have to do preemptive surgery, every woman uh, would have to have uh, her breast cut out at birth because uh, here the risk is actually much higher. <coughs> Unnecessary castrations have been criticized for some time also by doctors, however, to little avail. And on the other side, if a child is raised male, but has a uterus and ovaries, those are cut out in reverse. While doctors claim to produce normal-looking genitals, persons concerned still report being teased, also in the case of so-called successful surgeries, because of star, scars and unusual appearance, let alone in cases of admittedly bad results. Another typical example of traumatizing non-surgical treatments include repeat forced medical display and unnecessary and brutal genital exams. Since 1950, intersex genital mutilations have been practiced systematically and on an increasingly industrial scale all over the developed world. Since 1950, for children considered not normal by doctors, it's been mostly either clitoris reduction or hypostasia surgery, as shown here. Since 1950, it's pediatric endocrinologists, together with pediatric surgeons, leading the treatments, garnering millions for research projects nowadays. And this despite the obvious fact that medicalization and medicalized, uh, it? medicalized uh, counseling of parents inevitably <laughs> results in more and even more unnecessary cosmetic surgeries on defenseless children. For more than 20 years now, survivors and their organizations denounce intersex genital mutilation publicly as grave human rights violations and demand justice. However, despite, despite otherwise <coughs> statements by doctors, today still about 90% of all children concerned get submitted to unnecessary and harmful surgeries. Only recently, some human rights bodies started to acknowledge the grave human rights violations, notably, as mentioned, the Special Rapporteur on Torture, as well as the Council of Europe, who called for legislative measures. However, up to now, for example, the UN Rights Council and the Committee for the Rights of the Child still ignore IGN, despite repeated calls for support by survivors. This research surgeon is uh, an exception, and he was the first doctor to highlight the urgent need for legislation to eventually end the mutilations. However, the Swiss federal government still refuses to implement the recommendations by its own commission. Therefore, it is vital that international human rights bodies really raise the pressure on national governments. Thank you. Before introducing the next, um, the next speaker, I want to remind you that the kind of practices <coughs> that you saw it in the screen are taking place without informed consent and without medical need. So you can say these are practices that have been taking place, that are taking place in medical settings, but the reasons are not medical reasons are connected with the, but the way in which for cultures define standard female and male embodiments. <coughs> so 
we have doctors in all countries of the world, and I, I want you to be I want you to be very conscious about that, performing these kind of interventions just because they consider that it's better to have like the experience of genital insensitivity, for example, than to face the rest of the humankind with a body that looks different. Even if the bodies that they produce at your soul are different because of medical intervention. So in the same sense that we are saying that uh, intersex issues are human rights issues, they are strongly co also connected with sexual and reproductive issues and with normative productions of gender. So I will pass the floor to Paul. Uh, Nella, Marcus, and uh, Mary, thank you, and thank you again um, for the invitation from Art International and from Ilga to allow this space to occur. That's quite a hard presentation to follow. Um, I'll start just by saying many of you may have heard me speak yesterday, so I'm going to be a little more contextual today, and um, I'd also like to end by not yet. <laughs> I'd like to end by um, offering the opportunity by three short videos um, from colleagues and uh, human rights defenders in other parts of the world to speak, which in five to ten minutes we will uh, share. So, first of all, you know I'm Holly, I'm from the UK, um, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, uh, I'm an auntie, and I'm very shortly going to be a mum. It's been incredible, actually, the last three years because this journey for Intersex UK started um, with no money. There is still no money. Um, it started through a support group, and at that support group, I sat around a table with some other now human rights defenders and watched parents crying and thought, someday soon I'll see in the newspaper there have been changes. And I suddenly realised that that may be through the work of myself and now my new and recent colleagues undertake. My own personal story is um, it's complex. Um, I was actually, when I was young, assigned a male gender. Um, <coughs> obviously that wasn't correct. Um, I had ambiguity at birth, it was a minimal as far as the doctors expressed to my parents at that stage. But that, uh, that ambiguity increased through secondary development. And I am who I am today. Teenage years were incredibly difficult, as were childhood years. Um, medical intervention and treatment started in my teens. I'm still experiencing a huge number of problems due to the surgery that was performed and that surgery was um, incredibly damaging. Uh, I don't know how many surgeries I've had. Um, I have lifelong conditions due to the surgeries that I've experienced. It's been a very difficult, uh, difficult childhood to reflect on, but what I would like to say is that I'm here today to actually reflect that we can be a positive role model for a new generation. We can outreach to parents. We can out keep outreaching to doctors. We can, as we are doing in the UK, outreaching to the government to ensure we absolutely address all these issues of inequality and abuse. Um, so I'm really actually thrilled by the previous presentation, um, and I'm sure you'll appreciate why that's the case. Um, It's really hard to sit here, but it's also very humbling to be a voice for thousands and thousands of children and families who, at this stage, don't have the voice due to fear, shame, secrecy. Um, and I think what we need to recognise is that the majority of families, pretty much all families, don't intend to harm their children. Quite the opposite, of course. But there's such a lack of support in this area. And as has been stated already, there's the belief that by infusing somebody with hormones or deceiving somebody of the truth or mutilating somebody through the intervention of a scalpel, we will somehow er eradicate fear that people are faced with. And what that boils down to meaning in reality 
is that children become a vessel, they become a tool, and they become a bridge to ease the discomfort and the social fear that's misperceived by adults who have irreversible deciding choices that they enact and enforce upon children. I want to make it clear that we are here to support families and we're here to grow this new group in a positive way as far as acknowledging that, that there's no more space to just be recognised by peer-reviewed papers because these, there might only be sorry, three affected, directly affected individuals sat here and, and the fourth person about to speak to you from Australia but in the UK alone, there's an estimated 30,000 people affected by variations of sex anatomy development. That's a huge number of people, all of which are subjected to deceit at times, lies, frequently, abuses without their consent. And we really need to remember that the only damage that really comes and affects these children is, is not the damage that their healthy bodies represent, in the vast majority of cases at birth, but the damage that is bestowed upon them by people who feel correcting something that is tangible and physical is a certain way to ensure their future happiness. Well, it isn't. And that's why tens of thousands of people are now speaking. However, of course, very few people understandably want to raise their heads and um, I appreciate the reasons why. Very briefly, um, I'm just going to explain the situation in the UK a little bit. Um, I think it goes without saying that the protection of the body of a minor is paramount. Um, the support of the family is absolutely vital, and that should be coming through acknowledged, respected peer support. Um, the family, of course, always wants to do what's right for their child, but has no knowledge of how to do this because there aren't voices out there. Nowadays, there are a few more support groups, but there still is no direct contact. There's no legislation to protect children. As far as civil rights are concerned in the UK, um, there are certain conditions which prevent the change, should I say, correction of a birth certificate. What that means, in essence, is that someone such as myself can grow up, and now I am stuck at present, although challenging it, with a male birth certificate, which means not do I suffer, not do only I suffer the civil inequality of being unable to marry or have a civil partnership if that's the case. My partner's also limited in being able to engage in that too. Um, there are also significant issues due to birth certificate identification which prevent um, many other civil rights, such as a right through the judicial system to be treated equally, which is also a human right, of course, um, the right to family, the right to privacy, um, a balanced right to education, and, and health care. Um, do you know, the intersex movement's been rolling along and doing incredible work for a long time, and I'm really blessed to be sat here. But this event, from this event onwards, I need to see people speak to their own countries and, and their own delegations and realise that what we're saying is not just about three or four people sat in front of you. It's hundreds of thousands of people with no geographical boundaries, no religious or okay, religious differences do affect the treatment of intersex people, but it's, it really is a human necessity to really, really understand and focus on the numbers are significant. And to, for people to recognise that that isn't going to be something that affects them is, of course, why many of us are here, because every human rights abuse and civil rights abuse affects all of us in the form of the world that we live in. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the UK, other than we have, after two and a half years of no funding, We've somehow been catapulted forward to a place where the British government will now be meeting with us, or members of Parliament will be meeting with us at the end of March to look at how we can strategically plan a future and a direction 
which I hope and those involved hope may be an all-party representation. It's absolutely vital that this is the case. Um, presently, the UK is breaching Article 8 of the European <coughs> Human Rights Act. We're breaching other signatory, other um, Human Rights Act Acts, which have been signatories to, and numerous other uh, certain uh, um, human rights in specific areas. Um, at that point, what I'd like to do is just say thank you for listening to me. Um, you're normally a little more fluent than I am. I'm completely thrown. And I think that in itself is a really important message. The message that I'm being thrown by the video that I've just seen, and the presentation that I've just seen, I think signifies the difficulty we probably all face in talking to you, and the reason tens of thousands of people won't speak to you. Um, I don't want to do this, but I do this because, as the other people here, I care very much. And on that point, I'm going to pass over to three of my colleagues, and Tarby, I believe, um, is the first presenter, um, and then shortly followed, so a three-minute uh, video, shortly followed by another human rights defender, Jim Bruce. And Tarby's from South Africa, Jim Bruce is from the States. And then an incredible colleague and uh, another incredible activist, Lord Wolf Stevenson, who's a senior government uh, Labour peer, who he himself will offer his story to you and his political views. <coughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Intem Singh Oina from South Africa. And I was born in six. I was born with a biggest gentleman. And for a very long time in my life, I was extremely ashamed about it. Um, and because um, the idea of sex and genitals is not an open conversation in African culture, it's not something that we talk about as Africans, I really struggle to get uh, clarity from my parents about who I am and you know, where I come from. And I asked my mother one day, that, how was it like when she gave birth to me? And she couldn't answer me. And I kept repeating the question over and over again, and she couldn't answer me. But one day, because my mother was extremely supportive, and I do miss her because she passed away this year, in February 2012, she was extremely supportive of her. What she told me is that um, the only thing that I wanted was for you not to feel as hurt and ashamed as I felt after I gave birth to you because she gave birth to me at home, not in a hospital, and there were midwives there. And in African culture, unfortunately, uh, the birth of a child is the mother's responsibility, and if there's something wrong with the child, the blame goes to the mother. And so she felt extremely isolated after giving birth to me. And she says to me, all that I ever ask is that you not feel the same pain that I went through after giving birth to you. And it's not that I was ashamed that I gave birth to a child like you. It's because people put me in that position. So it took a long time for me to actually accept myself. And because I have never been operated on, the shame, the shame, all that I wanted to do was to get an operation for a long time in my life. And I hated going to the public hospital because over and over again I became this guinea pig for doctors. I became so abused by the doctors to a point where by everyone I got sick and I was so sick that I could not go to the doctor. The only doctor I would go to was private medical doctors, but those were expensive and I could not afford them. And I was so angry at myself that I could not go to a private doctor because I needed to be on my operation. That's what I thought in my head. But the more I met other people like me, the more I realized how privileged I am that I didn't get an operation. That I'm thankful that I did not get an operation when I was, when I was born. Because people who did, you know, they're going through a very hard time at the moment because the surgeries have got very negative effects on them. So I'm not ashamed of who I am anymore. I love myself. And I want to tell innocent people that you can't expect people to love you if you don't love yourself first. You need to live your life because Nobody is shameful.
Thank you.
but I felt very difficult about that. And, uh, it's only when I was about 13 and 5, I realized that I was not alone, I was in the same position, that it was kind of well recognized that those people with that experience had some difficulty in forming relationships, or difficulty making friendships, and to engaging with the normal humanity, normal conditions of life. So, I, for instance, I lived in a book to a in a public changing room, didn't to do sport in case I was exposed in that way. So a pretty really difficult time. You have a, a saying which is on your visiting cards, and I was struck by nobody is shameful. That was reminded me that my mother used to say that to me when I was growing up. And the, the way she expressed it was that there was nothing to be ashamed of in the human body. Of course, that's true, but there was an irony because she knew I had had babies because uh, my grandfather brought into the world. And that must have been discussions about that. But she never discussed that. No, no, until she, she's not dead, so we can't have that conversation. But I wish she had been practiced what she said. There is a role for legislation in this area, particularly, for instance, for those who've been involved in intersex, where I think that medical advances are not uh, supported by medical change. So, for instance, in the the same sex marriage bill, there wasn't the space for those who had yet to declare which sex they wish to uh, be considered. And therefore, we do need to revisit this and think this through with the participation of those people who have got the condition so that we can not collect the solution. Problems I've experienced, I think, are lack of knowledge and, in particular, lack of information from your parents. So, if I have any message for parents, it is to tell your children about what the condition is, to talk to them about it, to explain what the issues are, and to take the journey with them as they go through various medical investigations and so on. But also make sure that the child has a right to express his or, in some cases, her interests here. At age one or two, the child cannot be. But as they get older and they understand what the situation is, then they should be, it should be encouraged to be so. And the message to the medical profession is that there is a tendency, certainly in the United Kingdom, to operate first and then to consider how that operation is affected people later. I think that's wrong. I think we need to spend a lot more time. Discussing with the patient, that means the child, what will happen as a result of the operation. And all of them in the process, because that's the only way that justice is important. Thank you. 
or model or kind of anatomical differences. We have the same range of sexual orientations and gender identities as non intersex people, but we experience a stigmatization in our bodies. My personal experience includes being diagnosed late as an adult and then undergoing a series of four surgeries in just four months, leaving me with significant mental and physical health issues. Those medical interventions included an outcome that I did not consent to. And every individual in the sex member of OAI in Australia has experienced some form of non-consensual medical intervention. In the past year, Australia has added intersex data to anti-discrimination legislation. It's improved access to healthcare services, established federal guidelines for gender recognition, and also published a parliamentary committee report on the involuntary or coerced sterilization of intersex people. <coughs> While incomplete, with a Senate report that remains unimplemented, and that community remains unfunded and barely recognized, these developments are well leading. Inclusive anti discrimination legislation took effect in August 2013. The law authentically recognizes intersex status as biological, distinct from sex, gender identity, and sexual orientation. It offers genuine, useful protection. We recognize that intersex status is not the only way of achieving active inclusion. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights is considering an attribute called body diversity. On foot of that law, uh, the government committed to removing sex or gender from descriptions of medical procedures, ensuring their health system is open to all people with other nothing to need. It's a great start, even though our pharmaceutical benefit scheme still has gender specific language. On gender recognition, passports with an X sex marker have been around for over a decade since the first intersex Australian forced recognition of a chosen intermediate birth certificate. These passports appeal to some intersex people and also some trans people, and for them it's crucially important to be recognised. As an adult with an X passport, it feels good. My experience of travel to Europe is straightforward, but I can't. In, in the room for the immense contribution to the success of this session from Fisher, from, from Market International, and other businesses, from Ilga and Adam Hennings, and Ulysses Carroll here. Thank you very much, uh, guys, for, for allowing us to be here with you. Thank you.
probably that is uh, uh, how it works internationally in the baby steps and it goes very, very slowly. Um, uh, I think with respect to, to, to intersex, uh, I think uh, still a lot of people are, are not aware of the issue, simply do not have the knowledge. Um, and um, I noticed that maybe for the first time uh, there, there's a so-called LGBTI core group in New York which consists of countries and, and, and NGOs and OHHR and we organize a site event every year and last year we had a site event in the UN around uh, on the International Human Rights Day, 10th of December and it was the first time that we had an intersex person in the panel of Human Rights event from the US, Ida and Gloria and, uh, and she told her story and that was, I mean I think for a lot of people, they simply didn't realize that, it, that this even existed. And, um, so in that respect, um, and I think, uh, like my Canadian colleagues said, there, we still have to do a lot of work on you know, reaching out and telling people what this is. So um, it's not really fair because I can't really answer your question, but I, I would be interested to hear from you and from the others maybe how, uh, where you see the role of the UN, I mean, now the Human Rights Council, and, and, and what would you like to see happen with the UN? That's uh, my question to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I my name is Kara. I'm a student here in Geneva at the Graduate Institute. Um, I'm also a uh, member of our uh, Graduate Institute's online student magazine, looking for an article about the LGBTI community. Um, my point of view is because of, there isn't enough, I think, general awareness of um, you know this of the intersex community and the struggles that you all have to deal with, what I want to deal with. Um, what is a good way to open up that discussion? What is a good question to ask somebody? And what's maybe not a good question to ask somebody? Um, being someone who doesn't know a lot of community, um, this presentation was often really uh, enlightening and eye-opening for sure, but to learn more, what would you suggest is a good way to open it up to other people around you who also um, are a little bit um, unsure of the situation? Hi, thank you very much for this wonderful panel. I'm Esther Kishmati. I'm a human rights lawyer, worked as a human rights advisor in the for the past 10 years, and I'm still a consultant with them and working on the international classification of diseases from the human rights perspective. And I'm just wondering if you could say a couple of words that you see a lot of interaction between WHO as a professional health organization influencing medical standards and the Human Rights Council, how they work together in terms of implementing and integrating human rights standards into uh, or harmonizing human rights standards with health standards. And the WHO constitution is recognizing the highest dependent world standard of health and human rights in general. And now we see a great development on issues including abortion, family planning, that are contested issues. But the human rights councils work are influencing this kind of work. And I've seen your statement that you are concerned about the international classification of diseases. So, and health conditions. So, can you see a couple of words? What would you expect from the Human Rights Council and the member state? How to pay attention to this ongoing process that now is postponed and being decided by 2017? So, there is still enough work for, for collaboration. If you have any vision, how these two organizations can work together? We will start with. Uh, yeah, the answers. Who wants to do it? So, the question is, if I answer Kara's question, I don't normally need a microphone. Yeah, I, I think um, Mara is more. Um, Experience to answer the uh, question about um, ICOD and WHO. Um, 
if I talk a little bit to Cara about how you approach, um, I wasn't quite sure on what level you're talking about approach. You, you talk. I mean, just to people who are part of the intersex community, people who are not part of the intersex community, um, who identify as being intersex, yeah. you know, I mean, I'm sure I have plenty of peers who also are aware of these issues and what's going on. Um, and so, um, to talk to someone who maybe it, who does identify as being intersex, what, like, how do you, if I want to ask me a question about the community, <coughs> but like, I don't want it to come off seeming ignorant or offensive. Sure. I think, um, I think the first thing to remember is that um, sometimes some individuals will define as intersex, and other individuals will define as having an intersex condition or use <coughs> any other form of terminology which um, best suits them. Um, I think any form of approach, whoever and whatever the subject is, um, has to come from the heart. And that perhaps isn't the most legal approach, but it's the approach that's worked for us in the UK. It's very simple. You need to just ask somebody what you're feeling and perhaps put in place uh, initially that you come from a good place and you want to support and, and, and look at how that help can be attained. Um, it's interesting when we talk about LGBTI. Um, LGBT um, and LGBTI is, is a great affiliation to have because it's through these affiliations that we're now and the work that we've done previously, we're now sat here today. Um, however, I think it's also important to recognise that we can speak as being, um, in, in the sense of my position, um, I can reflect on being a Western uh, representative. And in being in that position, I also recognise the difficulties that LGBTI can have uh, on personal levels to individuals, um, but also in other countries and different regions. So the association of I with LGBT in certain um, southern regions produces huge problems. Um, in regions where LGBT um, is, is a criminal offence to, uh, to the point of all the news that we're hearing presently, um, Uganda, Nigeria, Russia, etc. So to associate an eye onto that acronym becomes really problematic for people who have biological uh, differences of their sex anatomy. However, saying that, I think there's unity to gain from working with a host of different organisations and, and that's in all associated areas of human and civil rights. And that balance has to be struck because it's a working relationship for the future and it's a relationship that's proved successful today. It's also given us a chance to acknowledge that I in itself is not wholly identified but part of some people and equally we need to be able to afford our own voice um, as individual uh, representatives within a collective organisation international. Um, saying that, of course, I think it's been appropriate to say that because I think the links we have are fantastic. So a slight segue of question and answer there, but I think just remember with people, and all you have to relate our experiences to are if you had your genitals removed or you were enforced, experienced enforced uh, sterilization or infusion of hormones without your consent. If each and every single one of you in this room imagine what it's like to go through that, that's what we've experienced and what hundreds of thousands of other people experience. I'd like to answer the, the question about the, the Human Rights Council and what can the UN do. Uh, for, for, for us, from, from, from our group, uh, well, one problem is, uh, for example, uh, the Human Rights Council has been approached by intersex organizations uh, within the UPR for uh, at least two times now. That The groups have written uh, NGO reports for the UPR, but, but uh, every time intersex has just been ignored. There, there was no response at all, uh, and we're a bit uh, at, at a loss. Uh, did, did we or the other groups do something wrong, or, or what could be an angle to convince the Human Rights Council to make a, a good statement, like, for example, 
the special rapporteur and coordinator be because uh, this would really really be helpful and then help uh, raise the pressure on national governments. The, the same is uh, with the child rights committee that there has been uh, at least twice uh, had been uh, submitted uh, intersex issues in, in shadow reports, but uh, up, up to now it, it has just been ignored. And, uh, right now, uh, our group at the moment, we're in the process of uh, filing an NGO report uh, for Switzerland, which will be discussed uh, next January. And, uh, we're a bit late with the report, we hope to finish it soon. But uh, we're also asking ourselves, uh, why, are we do, why are we taking all this pain and doing all this work and will it just be ignored once again? Or what would be any possibilities uh, for us to, sen to, to sensitize uh, the, the CRC committee? Well, what would be possibilities to, to make them understand that this is really a pressing issue and that without the pressure from international human rights bodies, no, nothing will change? Because, uh, for example, as mentioned, the, the, the Committee Against Torture and also the CEDAW Committee were the only two committees up to now who included intersex issues in uh, concluding observations and this was really, really helpful and we would like to see more of this. And with regards to the WHO, they are uh, preparing a statement on a forced uh, sterilizations and uh, this is also in, 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 the, in the works for quite a while now but uh, as far as I know uh, it, that, that there should be a specific section on intersex which uh, hopefully will be good and which will be very much welcome. Um, you know I, I keep uh, hearing this thing identify like intersex as a controversial issue, but you know, come on, all human, issue, human rights issues are controversial. If they stop being controversial, it's because they are dead, or there's some kind of agreement that they don't matter anymore. So, like, I would really like the UN to stop identifying intersex as difficult, challenging, and controversial, uh, because all of the issues are. So if we don't have one accepting that kind of qualification, disqualification for other issues, they said, yeah, you know, they're controversial, so, so what? And yeah, maybe they require some kind of study, but you know, a lot of human rights violations, very specific human rights violations, needs people just to pay attention to a specific, a specific wording, and then you can make the links with the human rights um, framework. And as well as there are many entry points to talk about intersex issues, so sometimes we talk about LGTBI, but you can talk about intersex issues when you're talking about violence against women, for, uh, for example, or because a lot of intersex people are women, or because surgeries are performed uh, for intersex people to be assigned as, as women, so a large portion of intersex procedures are feminizing procedures, so in fact, a clitoridectomy performed for intersex reasons is a clitoridectomy and it can be encompasses, you know, as, or described as violence against women and you have rights of the child and there is language uh, when we talk about the rights of disabled people, for example, to connect the interaction between like bodies that varies from standard and biotechnology and the law and, and human rights. So, um, it's like the entire system is there, you only need to put, you know, in intersex and make it, uh, and make it work. Um, the, you were asking about uh, the regional bodies. Well, the, the, um, the Inter-American um, Commission has an, an historic uh, hearing on intersex just last, last year. And intersex have been have been uh, introduced and it, okay, LGT, as LGTBI in the different resolutions coming from from the Inter American Inter American Commission. So at, at the Latin American region, we're really happy with this kind of of, of development. And 
In terms of uh, talking about intersex issues, I think that there are different ways <coughs> of talking about that. Personally, what I hate is when journalists decide that they need to have like the two voices in the discussion. So they can have someone talking about human rights violations, again, intersex people are talking about genital mutilation, and say, but now let's ask a doctor. But you don't do that when you're talking about rape, for example, or obstetric violence. So have that in mind, that when you are introducing a doctor justifying the surgeries, you are not having the two sides of the debate. You are having the perpetrator and the victim on the same page. So basically, you are aligning yourself with the perpetrator. And you, even if you are trying to be respectful for the intersex person that is talking, you are going to force that person to leave with the, the, the words of the doctor in the same page. And when people think about intersex suffering, that kind of experience is also experience of suffering. And they said, really, the world accepts this treatment that much that they even, you know, keep, we, we, we said that doctors are, human, are violating our human rights, but anyway, they have, you know, the ground to express their opinion and to justify human rights violations. So I would say uh, that if you want to talk about intersex issues from a human rights perspective, you need to make sure that all people talking in that uh, uh, press uh, uh, article in, in your in your report is having a position you know that that is coherent with that commitment. In terms of the Human Rights Council, you know I just have like simple dreams. I want the treatment that we receive to be identified as human rights violation. Um, I don't know what follows from that, um, but. We really need that kind of clear message coming from the council. Um, most of the doctors are they still believe, and this is the kind of knowledge that they have. It's what they study. It's what the you know the chief of the services are telling them. This is the standard medical protocol. So we need to do something that sounds really simple to do, but. It's not that simple. To identify a well-established medical protocol as a human right violation. So I would really love to see WHO and the Human Rights Council to compete on, on, on that, saying, you know, we're going to be the first institution in declare that this treatment is a human rights uh, violation. But uh, so far, um, we have almost 50 sex diagnoses distributed in different chapters of the International Classification of Diseases. Most of them are in my favorite chapter, the chapter on malformations. And for example, in a conversation that I have with people from, from WHO, they say, uh, we understand your discomfort, but there is nothing prescriptive in describing a body as malformed. So we don't see the problem of malformation so they couldn't connect malformation with treatment. They said it's not a prescription, it's a description. And your problem is with the treatment and we're classifying um, you know, diagnosis and not necessarily treatment. But we need to establish, we need to establish a clear connection between uh, diagnosis and treatment and to accept that at some point in history, something that was accepted as a standard medical treatment stopped being the standard medical treatment and that the world realized that something that was considered to be right is wrong. So, how to move from, from right to wrong is something that we don't, still don't have the answer because for us, I mean, it's, it's, quite, it's quite simple, but we need your help to make the link, and not only the modern link, we need to make the normative link going from, from the council to the WHO, from the WHO to the council, from the council to the countries, to the countries to the local legislation, you know, regulating what's going on at every, at every surgical room. Um, I, I think um, a vital aspect of um, telling a, a story of intersex conditions or intersex people um, 
is to make sure the bridge building is always implemented into that story. So um, the importance of um, valuing the equal platform that somebody affected um, professional activists, educators, human rights defenders can speak on because that's primarily where I think media pressure um, turns into a government pressure. Um, and that's certainly an area that's been uh, significantly successful for us. I think the most important aspect of communication is to recognise that despite what's occurred in the past, we invite people to come and learn through our stories. We invite people to recognise that um, away from being somebody with an intersex condition, in my own case I'm also a businesswoman, I have um, a successful life which in many respects I have to say unfortunately has probably been successful to fill in huge voids in my life um, with my drive. Um, but what that means is that there are many of us out there who are um, not just peer-reviewing individuals, but who are professional in many capacities of life, and that's why we have to be brought into discussions. We have to not be excluded at the door. Uh, a key example, um, without divulging too much information, would be an international medical conference, which I wasn't invited to, but attended, and uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Daniela and Marcus, um, also attended recently. Um, it's a biannual event. It was held in the UK. It was an international delegation. People were terrified, absolutely terrified to speak to me. I felt ostracised from the moment I walked in. It was the fourth uh, gathering of its kind, and yet still, every two years, so in the, yeah, a period of time, still nobody was invited to speak who was personally affected. And we had to sit there, and this was only uh, last year, yeah. we had to sit there at that time, blurs. we had to sit there and um, witness numerous presentations, visual graphics, of surgeries which are irreversible, that are still happening in the context of this particular presentation or in Europe. And uh, what isn't recognised is that there will be no progression without anecdotal response because people will continue enacting what they believe is correct. And, and this is what's continuing day after day after day. Right now, children in Europe today will have their genitals cut, will have their gonads removed, will be pumped full of hormones to make adults and society feel more comfortable about what's perceived as normal. And quite frankly, we could all line up, strip naked, and define what normal is, right? I don't think so. I really don't. So let's build bridges and ensure that in any article that's written, in any news piece that's developed, a bigger and bigger podium is being built to recognise that we're professional, we're intelligent, we have voices, and we're individuals that matter in the negotiations of how this moves forward. I'd like to add an observation to Mao, uh, who was talking about uh, medical standards or later being uh, recognized as human rights violations. And uh, I, I don't know if you are aware that uh, in the 19th century, Western medicine, uh, clitoris amputations uh, were quite frequent uh, because of uh, a, uh, against uh, uh, women, because of, uh, as a measure against uh, hysteria, masturbation, and enlarged clitoris. And while uh, the first two reasons, uh, there was strictly a controversy also amongst doctors and eventually it was abolished uh, after World War II, almost everywhere. Uh, at the same time, in 1950, clitoris amputations because of uh, enlarged clitoris took a sharp rise. Uh, this is also a form of discrimination that uh, on the one hand you have the real women and uh, their clitorises have to be protected. And uh, on the other side, you have the abominations, and there everything is justified uh, just to make uh, in people more comfortable and uh, make them look more normal. And, and we, we have to try to achieve that uh, the, this third reason uh, is going to be ostracized uh, the same as the other one, and that uh, finally it should be recognized that uh, this is not right. Can I? Um, just on the point of clitoral enlargement, um, the, a comment that's usually used, and um, forgive me if many of you may be familiar with this, 
But when we look at the size of the clitoris, um, we look at 0.9 centimetres as being maximum. Anything beyond that is a reduction. <coughs> as Maru uh, highlighted, there are a few um, recognised uh, medical experts, consultants, professors who are attempting to try and reduce intervention surgically. However, the majority still are. So based on that fact, that if a clitoris is over X size, it's reduced surgically, um, leaving perhaps a lack of sensitivity uh, and a whole host of other issues. What would happen if a penis was oversized? Do you know what, if, that, if we were talking equally and medically, that would be reduced in size too. The last statistic I heard was uh, in inches, um, imperial, uh, 5.6 inches for a, a Caucasian Western uh, phallus was an average size when erect. So if someone had a penis that was 7 or 8 inches when erect, technically we should be removing a couple of inches off that. Can you imagine the outcry? And that's happening to women. And it's female genital mutilation, it's also male genital mutilation. I don't know if there is someone that wants to make a comment or a very brief question. We we need to keep the room in, in ten minutes, otherwise I would say something. But yeah, please do. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think both of you are music those who don't like Andre did the seat on the International Lesbian Gay, Bisexual, Trans and today very proudly Intersex um, Association. Um, I work on these issues uh, day in, day out, and I have to say I have been moved and honored to sit in this room uh, with you and see uh, the intersex movement out uh, here. It's been phenomenal, it really has. Um, and I think what's also fascinating for me is how, how is it that we're not talking about this more? And then I hear us talking about enlarged clitorises and we talk about penises, and, and, it's, and I understand why we don't talk about it, because we don't like to talk about our bodies. We certainly don't like to talk about our genitalia, and we don't like to talk about anything down there. Um, so thank you for talking, and I know it's painful, um, and I know it's, it's uh, painful doesn't even begin to talk about this, but I think it's really helpful to have this conversation. Um, so, so thank you. Um, when I think the question came, what can states do, and we have in this room a few governments that are sitting here, and we've heard some of the suggestions, we've heard about the UPR process where no recommendations are made um, on intersex issues at all. Um, that is something that governments can do um, immediately. Um, and in doing so, listen to intersex civil society. Mauro mentioned um, the Malta um, Declaration, for want of a better word, the statement of intersex civil society. And we've got several copies around the room. There are more people here than we thought were going to be here, so there's not enough. That's wonderful, there's more of you. Um, but it's really easy to Google, <coughs> type intersex and Malta. It's pretty much going to be your first hit. Um, and if you go in there, you'll find a list of what intersex activists have actually agreed internationally from all regions have come together with a very clear statement of what intersex activists and intersex communities want. So if you're a government um, or an NGO and looking to find out what's going on, go to that. It's a good starting point. Um, and then I think there's also a question for the room, and maybe there won't be time to ask, answer it today, but it relates back to the WHO um, and the ICD. And what is the difficulty of getting the message to WHO, and what is the disconnect from Human Rights Council to the WHO? And I know you asked the panel that question, but I actually wonder if states who are um, at the WHO or even those working in the WHO secretariat could you know, could better explain if there's a way to somehow get the human rights message which we hear so clearly um, just up the hill a few hundred meters um, over there. Thank you. I'm not representing WHO here, so what I'm saying is not on behalf of WHO, but the disconnect is very political and administrative. Uh, the World Health Assembly consists of ministries of health. The Human Rights Council is a different body, whether it's the foreign ministry or other ministries in the, in the government. So actually, at the state level, it has to be a multidisciplinary approach to approach this and, and bring together the two bodies. And 
in the nature of the field of disconnect all the time. So it's somehow a political disconnect that can be established. And there are precedences of amazing collaboration when states collaborate with the international level and bring the experience and share it with others. So if there would be pioneers who are showing how to do that, it could be a very wonderful process. Um, I, I wanted to say something as to react to what Andre said. Um, we have many um, challenges uh, when talking about intersex, and not only because people don't talk about bodies uh, very much, and that's why you know, many different intersex activists are insisting in the need of introducing not only gender expression, including, you know, like the corporal expression of, of gender, but also holding that diversity, or including intersex in, a, in the holding diversity uh, umbrella, because we, we feel that with sexual orientation and gender identity sometimes it's not, it's not enough to introduce intersex issues. But the other problem is that we depend a lot on our personal uh, stories, on, on, on testimonies, so something that states should be doing, and also for the travel job, to start collecting the big data uh, related to intersex issues and to do follow-up studies. We need the information, you know, to background, to know how many hospitals, how many people, what kind of surgeries, um, and, and, and we are sure that that's going to prove what, what we know informally, but we, we need like, the, official, um, the official numbers. And it also includes something that we didn't mention <coughs> specifically in this, in this panel, but it's something related to what in my country, Argentina, is defined as the right to truth. Uh, many intersex medical records are destroyed, they are concealed, people, intersex people don't have access to the medical records, all the re medical records are just false. So a lot of surgeries, for example, that are supposed to be, that, that they are, uh, they were supposed to be hernias uh, being removed are actually uh, gonadectomies. So sometimes it's really difficult for us to know and to understand what happened with our bodies. Uh, in some cases, in cases of, of uh, gender reactive sex reassignment at, at uh, birth, but someone, for example, was assigned as a boy and because the penis was considered to be too short, this person was transformed legally and surgically into a girl. The original birth certificate is destroyed. So we also have the right to truth in the sense of knowing exactly what was in our medical records. We need our medical records to be, to be true and to be available uh, to us. And that's something that states should be doing at the same time to make sure that these this kind of procedures are being, are being uh, followed. Um, I know that it's really difficult to address issues that are defined as medical issues, and I think that part of the problem with the conflict between the Council and WHO is that uh, WHO still defines intersex issues as medical issues, and that seems to be a contradiction with human rights as a way of politicizing. Uh, but anyway, even we are talking about medical settings, human rights are, needs to be part of the picture, and they are, they are part of this picture. So we need to make you know, that, that kind of link uh, work. Um, I think that we need to leave the room for the next session. Uh, thank you very much for coming uh, here today. Please don't be shy. If you have other questions or, or comments, we are going to be around today. Just come and, <laughs> and talk to us or contact us or contact Ilga or, or Art. And please keep you know, the, the conversation going on. Thank you. Thank you very much.